Hello, and welcome to the Charlian Forum. My name is Chris, and today I wanted to continue my exploration of the story of Final Fantasy XI with a video about the next expansion in the series, Wings of the Goddess. This expansion has diverging questlines depending on which nation you choose to ally with at the beginning, but all of the main story beats remain the same. So for this reason, I'm going to elect to omit the nation story missions from this video. I'm also only covering the main story missions of the expansion here, and like my other videos, I will not be exploring any side quests, associated missions that were added later, or any other content. I know that this rubs some people the wrong way, but if you really want to see these missions play out, check out Corvana's channel for all of the cutscenes from the expansion, or better yet, jump into the game and try them out yourself. Of course, shout out once again to Corvana, whose efforts to document Final Fantasy XI make these videos possible. Without further ado, let's jump into the time-warping story of Wings of the Goddess. The story begins with the mysterious appearance of strange structures known as the cavernous malls all around Vanadil. As we approach one, it springs to life, absorbing us and sending us to an unknown location. Once there, we see a large orifice in the sky, covered in crystals, before a voice rings out, asking us for help and appearing in a blast of energy, revealing a regal feline which sends us flying over the edge. We cut to two knights riding on their chocobos to meet with their companions before making their way to the battlefield to fight with the beastmen. There, they see a cavernous maw, much like the one that appeared before us, but this one is alive and well, floating above the ground. As they approach, they find us lying there on the ground. They speak with us, informing us to make for safety, as the open spaces here are rife with beastmen and are completely unsafe for civilians. We discover that we have been sent into the past, directly into the throes of the Crystal War, when the Beastmen and the Allied forces clashed and the Shadow Lord reigned. Once we arrive at our chosen area, we tell the guard that we are an adventurer, and he gives us the task of delivering a letter back to the main nation of our choosing. From there, we become a member of their military effort and complete a few nation-specific quests to continue the story. We eventually end up back at a cavernous mall, which absorbs us once again and spits us back out into that strange darkened area from before, where we hear that same voice belonging to the feline who reveals themselves. They tell us of a prophecy relating to a harbinger and a champion. They allude to the fact that we share some kind of hidden power to bend time itself but lack the ability to control it. They tell us that their mission is nothing less than stopping the war that rages across the land, and they ask us for aid in their task. Once we agree, they reveal their name to be Kate Sith, and they send us on our way to find a way to stop this war. We end up in Sandoria, where we see a crowd running to a performance of a dance troupe, the troupe Mayakov. We head towards the performance and see the leader of the troupe, Mayakov himself, who, which I just have to mention is depicted with a really funny written lisp, um, which I think is a way, you know, in 2007 at least, to imply a certain orientation. Anyway, he discovers that we don't have a ticket, and he has us promptly removed from the show. We notice a man named Turlo fighting with his wife about attending the show, but with nothing else we can do now, we travel back to our own time to try and gather clues. In Juno, we see who else but Turlo, now an old man, watching dancing performers in the street. He reminisces about that day in Sandoria, where he remembers the event we saw unfold, where his wife found him and forced him back home, making him miss the show. He tells us that people, even today, all these years later, Remember the performance that day of a dancer known as the Moonshade Butterfly. He reveals to us that he still has the ticket all these years later, and offers it to us, seeing no harm in giving the old relic to a kind stranger. Ticket in hand, we return to the past and enter the show, but Mayakov insists that the ticket must be a forgery and demands that we be thrown out of town for our deception. Just then, a knight appears, Rajalis, who comes to our aid, feigning to be our friend to help us get into the show. There he explains that he did so because he could sense our hardened warrior presence, stating that all soldiers deserve some time away from the horror that is this war. The show then begins with three dancers stepping out onto the stage. The middle dancer is revealed to be the Moonshade Butterfly, a dancer named Lilizette, who begins her fabled solo performance. Rajalis explains that her background is a complete mystery. She appeared from seemingly nowhere recently and joined the troupe passing their very strict standards with flying colors. All that's known about her is that her father is Elven and that her mother is a Hume, but her mysterious background surely lends to her high station in the zeitgeist. As we leave the show, Kate Sith appears and walks by in the background, startling us. But before we can learn more about that, it cuts to a scene of Rajalis being informed that a strategic position in the region is being overrun, and he commands his soldiers to deploy there immediately. However, he is informed that the remainders of his forces are far too small to reinforce the position adequately, 
to which he informs his soldiers that he has an ace up his sleeve. The dancers of Troop Mayakov have agreed to supplement their forces. It turns out the dancers are not simply showmen, but are also very capable fighters. We cut back to us chasing after Kate Sith, who begins to wax poetic about the state of things. The camera reveals that Lilizette is in the trees above us, staring down at our meeting curiously. Suddenly, more dancers appear, leaping out at Kate Sith, who is captured in their swift ambush. Kate Sith lashes out, escaping from their grasp before disappearing in a flash of energy. Lilizette reveals that she believes Kate Sith to be a beastman in disguise from the future, and her obsession with catching it is rooted in trying to divine their intention. Lilizette insists that we come with her, and she grills us on our relationship to the cat. We see Radulis and his troops, as well as Portia, the dancer that agreed to accompany them, about to head out. Lilizette runs over to them and alludes to having some knowledge of things not being meant to play out this way, and Portia admits that her predictions are often correct, which makes us think that Lilizette might be a time traveler like ourselves. With her warning going unheard, the group rides off. Lilizette then cuts straight to it, asking us if we've come here from the future. She mentions that by now we must have figured out that something feels wrong, giving us a breakdown of the events as we know them. The region that the knights are headed to will eventually be crushed and conquered by the orcs, who will then rename it to Devoy, a stronghold for the beastmen in our time. She tells us though that this event isn't supposed to be happening this early in the war, and that something must be amiss in the timeline for things to be shifting around like this. We arrive in Laval, where Lilizette attempts to tell the others that we've come to this time from the future, which they absolutely laugh off as an absurdity. Rajalis appears, saying that they need all the help they can get at the moment anyway, and asks us to accompany him into the village to aid with extracting locals and setting up fortifications. Fires suddenly engulf some of the buildings in the village, and RMN and demons appear, killing soldiers and some of the civilians. In the confusion, Lilizette sees Kate Sith atop one of the burning houses, but he disappears before we can make heads or tail of his appearance. A knight arrives and whisks us off to safety. Rajalis and his knights are fighting for their lives. With heavy losses, the knights triumph over the Dark Kindred. A commander appears, asking us where we and the dancers are, and Rajalis explains that one of his soldiers came to guide us to safety, but the commander says that no knight under that name exists. Rajalis, realizing that there must be some sort of deception, rushes to find us. When the scene catches up to us, a trap is sprung. Audrail is revealed to have led us into an ambush, with three demons arriving to attack us. Rajalis arrives, shouting for Portia, and quickly dispatching two of the demons while we handle the third. He attacks the traitorous knight, who deflects his blow with dark energy. We see a figure in purple clothing charging a ball of energy and then firing it at Rajalis, hitting him directly. The strange figure then appears next to the traitorous knight, who reveals himself to be a similar being clad in purple. He calls himself a Spite Warden of Lady Lilith. The Spite Warden then summons a dragon, which we battle and defeat. After killing its minion, the Spite Wardens make to flee for the battlefield, emitting a blinding flash of light. During the flash, Lilizette seems to enter a trance, seeing the darkened area we've seen a couple of times, and then a mirror-like portal showing her images of the world, devastated by war and crumbling. When Lilizette comes back to, the battlefield is empty, the Spite Wardens disappear, and she faints. When she comes to, we're in a safe spot, and Rajalis is seen collapsed, the dark aura surrounding his wound. Lilizette stands and calls out to him, saying father to everyone's shock. She insists that we do not move him and return to the village to seek medical aid for him. There she finally comes clean to us, telling us that she is indeed a time-traveling adventurer just like us, and that Rajalis is indeed to be her father. She explains that in ten years' time, the curse from the wound he just received will cause him to fall ill and eventually die. She reveals that she heard about the cavernous maws and traveled back with the intention of stopping him from ever getting the wound. She explains, however, that the events she learned about in the history books and her father's journals are not unfolding in the way that they should be. We cut to Kate Sith in the darkened area, surrounded by other Kate Siths, revealing that there are actually many copies of this little feline. They say that they'll keep an eye on Lilizette and go their separate ways. Back in Sandoria, Mayakov informs us that Portia and Lilizette are visiting Rajalis, making note that they've been doing so with increased frequency since he was wounded in Laval. As we speak to Rajalis, his wound flares up with dark energy, and he asks us not to speak of this to save the morale of his soldiers. Portia informs us that Lilizette mentioned heading to Jugner Forest, where we find her setting a trap for the Kate Siths. Lying in wait for a Kate Sith to show their face, one appears, springing the trap and capturing the cat. As we interrogate the cat we captured, another appears, followed by many more until we are completely surrounded. 
The Cades gather and discuss what they should do amongst themselves, alluding to the end goal of their mission being helping all of the children of Altana. They vote on if they should aid Lilizette in her quest or not, and are split down the middle saying instead of interfering, they should simply make us aware of a nearby item. They reveal the item to be a special type of resin, which can be used as a potent medicine. With a mysterious voice chiming in, fading into view, it is revealed to be Aquila, the Spite Warden. The Kates all scatter at the sight of the Spite Warden, but two are unfortunately struck by an energy blast, killing them. As Aquila makes to confront us, Haldrell's voice rings out and commands him to come back to wherever he came from. After the confrontation, we make for present-day Sandoria to speak to the family friend of Lilizette who used to prepare her father's medicine. She reveals that the plants used as the main ingredient have unfortunately gone extinct, but thankfully, we can go back to the past to harvest them. Once we do, we return to the medicine maker who finishes the recipe and gives us a bottle of the coveted medicine. With the vial in hand, we make for the chateau to find Rajalis in a meeting with the ambassador of Juno, Nagmalata, who reveals that the Duchy of Juno intends to surrender to the Beastmen. After Rajalis runs out to speak to the king to stop this from happening, Nagmalata approaches Portia, demanding that she come with him back to Juno. He kind of quickly gives up the ghost on that, weirdly enough, but he says that her accompanying him would be of paramount importance. With Rajalis needing rest, we offer to take the request of reinforcements to Bastok and Windurst on his behalf. We draw up support in both Bastok and Windurst, and we move on to Juno in order to help them stop their surrender. We meet with Brandolf, the captain of the Ducal Guard, who informs us that Nagmalata is away from the duchy on official business. We inform him of the reinforcements and tell him that Juno need no longer consider surrender. However, he informs us that we are too late, and that the Archduke has already made up his mind to surrender to the Beastmen. Nagmalata appears, telling us that the surrender ceremony is to be held soon, and leaves. Certain members of the Ducal Guard catch up to us, giving us a key to the area where the surrender is to take place and thanking us for rekindling their fighting spirit. Arriving at the surrender ceremony, Lilizette absolutely destroys orcish fighters before Nagmalata apprehends her. Just then, reinforcements arrive, and we begin the fight against the orcs in earnest. After the battle, Nagmalata appears, making some cryptic remarks and disappearing, before uh, another Nagmalata appears, explaining that he was indeed away on business. We surmise that the imposter was one of the Spite Wardens, and we cut to the Cates floating above the Beastmen who fled from Juno, speaking to their new target, Tavnesia. We then see the Spite Wardens, and the imposter Nagmalata reveals himself to indeed be Hodrail in disguise. Behind them stands one of the Cates, seemingly acting as a double agent for the Spite Wardens. They allude to Lilizette being present in this timeline, having some kind of importance before reaffirming their mission, securing the Matron's person and eliminating the Cates' Sith. We cut to the Spite Wardens in the Dark Zone from Revor, with a dark cloud erupting from the strange orifice in the sky. A glowing ball of energy floats down to the ground before erupting to reveal a new player in the game, one which the Spite Wardens bow to, clearly their leader. Back in Sandoria, we run into, literally, Lilizette. She explains that something's happening to people's memories, and takes us to the rest of Troop Mayakov, who don't remember her or us at all. Everyone's memories have been wiped out, and we see a small orb of energy being pulled from each of them as they leave. Thankfully, Mayakov himself and Portia still remember us somehow. Mayakov informs us that the Spite Wardens have been seen in the frigid north and allows us to head that way. We are introduced to Noy 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 Noyuri? Noyuri? I'm gonna go with Noyuri. Noyuri. Who has been tasked to ensure Radulis' recovery. Portia is not super into that idea. We head for Busidine Glacia, where the Spite Wardens were last seen. As we arrive, a Kate Sith comes falling from the sky, who we tell about the memory fading. Kate Sith reacts very badly to this news, saying that there must be a turncoat amongst her copies. She ponders if we are truly the heroes spoken about in the prophecy, and then asks us to help her out in finding the traitor. She gives us the task of attaching a shadow bug to the remaining Kate Sith in order to track their movements. We place the shadow bugs on the remaining Kates, which allows us to see their whereabouts. While we watch, Kate Sith tells us her backstory. There exists a realm which is both in the distant future and far in the past. Here, a soul possessed of boundless love lamented the Great Crystal War, and her grief was so strong that the land itself trembled. She wished to see the world tread a different path, one of peace, and so she created the Kates, agents of her will, to ensure that these events unfolded in the correct way in time, creating a more peaceful outcome. The soul is revealed, of course, to be the goddess Altana. We see one of the Cates on the move and head back out to track her destination. Upon finding her, we realize that they are indeed traitors, meeting with a spite warden named Larzos. 
Our position is revealed by Lilizette and Kate Sith, and we are confronted by the traitorous cat and Larzos, who summons a demon to battle us. Once defeated, we see a ball of energy leave him and fly off as we did from the dancers earlier. Just then, a massive avalanche occurs, and Lilizette and Portia are encased in a barrier by an Araman, who then escapes and flies away with both of them. We see Lilizette and Portia being moved into a chamber in the darkened area with the dark matron from before who insults Lilizette before telling Portia that she's welcome anytime. She then offers her deepest desire to Portia to save Rajalis from his dark wound. The matron has Portia and Lilizette thrown into a dungeon for now. Once we've recovered, we make for Sandoria to meet with Rajalis. We explain what happened in Busadine to him and Noyeri then enters and makes a huge show about going to Busadine in his stead as he should be resting. With Rajali sidelined, we head back to the glacier to find our companions. As the battle against the orcs rages in Busidine, Kate Sith attempts to locate the dancers, and finds that they are in an underground cave not too far away. With our companions keeping the beastmen busy, we enter the cave with Kate Sith. We make our way through the cave and eventually find the dancers in their mysterious bubble force field. The traitorous Kate Sith then appears and tells us that the future is determined not by us or our choices, but by a Tomos who they summon to the cave. Atomos, it is revealed, is the name of the gaping maws that have been appearing across Vanadil, and after appearing, it very quickly swallows up Portia. As all hope is seemingly lost, the power of Altana resonates within us and Lizette, manifesting as wings, like the prophecy foretold. The Cates, realizing that we are indeed the heroes of prophecy, sacrifice themselves, being swallowed up by the Atomos. However, something unexpected happens. A giant Kate Sith emerges from the maw of Atomos, shrinking back down to a normal-sized one. It would seem that all of the absorbed Kates have combined their power into a singular body, and with her help, we fight the traitorous Kate and win the day. After the fight, Otomos springs back to life, absorbing all of us and dropping us into that strange darkened area. We learn here that the Dark Matron's name is Lady Lilith, and she finally puts an end to the traitorous Kate Sith for failing her. Behind them, Portia is being held by the Spite Wardens, she tells us that Atomos has existed for time immemorial, devouring any time that it deemed as dispensable and depositing it here, a place called the Walk of Echoes. She mentions that Kate Sith knows all of this just as well as she does, noting that it was them who set these events in motion in the first place. Portia runs back towards Lilith after she baits her with the healing of Rajalis, and they go to leave. As they leave, Lilith calls Portia mother. Unable to accept this loss, Lilizette jumps after Lilith and the Spite Wardens, who disappear as they blast us away with powerful energies. When we come to, we find ourselves back in Busidine, surrounded by the bodies of beastmen and allies alike. We decide to make for Sandoria to break the news of Portia's capture to Rajalis. Upon hearing the news, it would seem that Rajalis's memory has been taken as well, not recognizing us and referring to Portia as a civilian. A mysterious knight approaches Rajalis to bend his ear about Portia, Strangely, he seems to remember her when he speaks to her and has a completely different reaction. With some brainstorming, we come up with the reality here that Lilith must be from a future where the Crystal War never ended. We decide that there must be some linchpin event, one that occurs in both timelines that affects the outcome of the Crystal War ending or raging on. With some deduction, we decide that this must be the upcoming Battle of Exarchabard, where Lilith is surely to make her next play. We head for Juno, where the Allied strategy meeting for the Battle of Exarchabard is underway. We decide to gather some additional information on how the battle played out by traveling to our present time to speak with survivors of the fight. As we arrive back in Sandoria, a strange scene occurs, with day turning to night and a massive comet hurtling towards the Earth before it suddenly flashes away seemingly no one seeing it except for us. After this, we meet with Halver. He reveals to us that Rajalis' entire unit is to be wiped out in the battle, but he is remembered as a hero from it. He then tells us that he does recall hearing of a man who visits Rajalis' grave religiously and tells us to seek him out for additional information. It's revealed that Rajalis' grave that his visitor is none other than Larzos, who we know as a spite warden, but in this time it would seem he's just a normal veteran of the war. He tells us that as they stormed the keep, a massive flash of light occurred and a huge clouded star appeared overhead. When they came to, Rajalis had a disturbed look on his face, but all of the beastmen laid dead at their feet. However, with the battle to fight, they moved on, not asking any questions. He mentions that Rajalis once spoke of a quiet pride in making a pact with darkness that day, and then leaves. 
Back in the past in Exarchivard, we gather with the allied forces and make our move. We cut to a scene of Lady Lilith and her spite wardens meeting with the Shadow Lord and his minion, Flit. You remember him. They tell the Shadow Lord that they know how this battle plays out and offer their hand in alliance to fight back against the allied forces. They accept and form a devious, dark, evil, bad guy alliance. Back to the allied forces, we receive word that the operation is now greenlit. The Battle of Exarchabard has officially begun. After helping Windurst and Bastok with their own tasks, we then report back to the Sandorian front. Here we find Rajalis and tell him of the success of the other two operations. Larzos appears and hands an object that he found to Rajalis. It turns out to be a Link Pearl, which Portia is using to communicate. Upon hearing her voice, Rajalis's facade crumbles, making him emotional as Portia tells him not to come to the castle through static. Rajalis decides to storm the castle anyway, leaving his lieutenant in charge of the front. We cut to Lilith, clearly happy that Rajalis is following the path that he is, and saying that with this move, the game is sealed. Checkmate. We see the allied forces ready their plan, starting with the Bastok explosives, followed by the Sandorian offensive on the front to divert attention, while the strike force cuts to the inside. Here we see that as we push through the castle, Rajalis is realizing that something isn't right. Too few enemies are here to defend their territory. We then find Portia in a circle of dark energy, and as we approach, a demon appears to defend her, telling us that we're fools for thinking that it would be this easy. The camera shoots outside, and we see the Shadow Lord himself enter the fray, absolutely decimating the entire allied force in a full-on frontal assault. Back inside, a strange rift appears above, its dark energy resonating with Rajalis and Portia's wounds, causing them to crumble. We fight and defeat the demon count, but Hadrail appears to take Portia back. Before he can, Portia threatens to end her own life, knowing only that she is important to Lilith's plans somehow. Before she can though, Noya reappears with some additional comrades in tow. With their much needed help, we escape the castle and flee outside. Outside, we witness the absolute devastation of the Shadow Lord's appearance on the battlefield. As we overlook the damage, a massive beam of dark energy erupts from the castle, once again resonating with their wounds. We witness the familiar orbs of energy leaving the bodies of the dead, gathering into a large ball which Lilith offers up to Atomos. We then see Kate Sith seemingly trying to bargain with Atomos, which proves fruitless, leading her to just try and find us instead. We return to Juno, where Regilis is ripped apart by the remaining leaders and banished, seen as nothing short of a disgraced traitor. He discusses with Portia and ominously states that the only way for him to accomplish his goal of making things right is to gain more power. We surmise that they will return to Castle's Vault for answers and chase them down with Kate Sith in tow. Here, Portia and Rajalis demand to know more about the power she spoke of that could allow them to keep fighting despite their wounds. She recites an altered version of the prophecy Kate Sith has been spouting all this time, making herself, the Maiden of Dusk, the center of the peace. Then Lilith does us all a huge favor and lays everything out really plainly, and thankfully we arrive just in time to hear more about what she says. Lilith tells us that in a thousand timelines, we lose the Crystal War every single time. She tells us that our future, where we win, is nothing more than an illusion, a dream of Altana that she wishes could come to pass. In reality, the Allied forces amassed and attacked Exarchabard, where they were nearly obliterated by the Shadow Lord. From this crippling defeat, the Dark Forces spread out, taking over all of the neighboring continents and eventually subjugating the entire world. The survivors bided their time and grew stronger so that one day they could rise up and retake their lands. Lady Lilith is indeed the leader of this ragtag team of fighters hoping to reclaim their world from the Shadow Lord. Kate reveals that in order to defeat the Shadow Lord, Lilith and her people made a pact with the dark divinity, Odin, and became the very thing they sought to destroy. Grieving the state of the world, Altana wept, and her tears became the Kate Sith, who eventually summoned Atomos, traveling through different timelines, planting seeds to attempt to create a different future for Vanadil. Spite Wardens and Lilith caught wind of this plan, though, and began doing some time-traveling, seed-planting chicanery of their own, defending their own timeline, as whichever was the least likely would eventually be consumed by Atomos, deleting it forever. As we ponder if any of that makes any sense, or if anything even exists, really, Odin finally makes his appearance, his telltale flame encircling Portia and Rajalis, who now both bear his mark in their wounds. Lilith then finally says what we all know to be true. She is indeed the daughter of Rajalis and Portia in her own future, an alternate version of Lilizette, who is the couple's daughter in our timeline. We fight and defeat Aquila and Hadrail, and then return with the others just in time to see Odin disappear. 
seeing that they are down a spite warden, Lady Lilith summons her trump card, the alternate reality version of our character, revealing them to be her final spite warden. At this news, Lilizette crumples, dumbling over, and eventually dissolving into light, where she is absorbed by Atomos. It would seem that with this defeat, the dark future has won, and Lilizette has ceased to exist. Defeated, we return to Sandoria, and we find Kate Sith. She tells us that things are changing in history, events unfolding in ways they never have before since Lilizette was absorbed by Atomos. We listen in on the Mayakov troop and hear them refer to Portia, not Lilizette, as the Moonshade Butterfly, showing us just how extensive this erasure has been. Of course, with Lilizette being deleted, that calls our existence into jeopardy as well, since we come from the same timeline, and without her being here to influence things, it could eventually end up where we all vanish and then nothing makes any sense. Kate asks that we head back to the north to see how the battle with the Alliance is going. We arrive seeing total devastation among the Allied forces. We see Lilith appear, attempting to explain the folly of the war to them and how fruitless their efforts will be. Her and the Spite Wardens then vanish, and Kate and the player discuss next steps, resolving that the only good option is to try and track down the Lizette inside the cavernous maw of Atomos and attempt to restore her. Back at the Walk of Echoes, looking up to Atomos for a way to bring Lilizette back, we're attacked by Larzos. Kate Sith sends us flying in defense, telling us to find all of Lilizette's memories and bring them all together, which should restore her. We travel around Sandoria and some other locations, gathering memories of Lilizette that linger in the world, as people are slowly reminded of her existence. After gathering up all the memories of Lilizette we can, we return to the Walk of Echoes through the cavernous mall. There, we find Kate Sith and show him the collected memories of Lilizette. As they appear, they drift slowly up to Atomos's mall, a massive beam of light erupting from the gaping hole and piercing into the real world. We rush to the location we think the beam fell, finding a crystal and a group of pixies. They tell us that someone new has just arrived. Presuming this to be Lilizette, we rush to their side to find a... egg? It seems as though Lilizette has returned, but the conditions are not quite right for her to be reborn. After some time, Kate sends us to find a rare insect called a punch bug. We return and she bottles it, giving it to us and explaining that it will act as a bridge of sorts between us and our memories of the future, which should bolster our ability to fight against the darker outcome, giving us a slight edge in the fight to come. With this new weapon in hand, we travel back to the Walk of Echoes, where we are confronted by the Spite Wardens, including the dark reflection of ourselves. We, of course, defeat them, our reflection dissipating immediately, while Larzo scoops up Portia and Radulis, taking them to safety, and then dying. After defeating them, we return to Lilizette's egg, where we hug it, and the wings of the goddess wrap around both of us, her power bringing Lilizette back into the world. We travel to where Lilizette and the player first met, finding a glowing spot on the ground, which Kate explains as a convergence of eventualities a nexus of sorts that allows the brighter future to exist through the events that occurred in this location. At these locations, there's something called a dawn drop, a sort of physical manifestation of this brighter future. We must travel to all of our biggest moments throughout the journey so far and gather them up. This acts as a sort of recap of the expansion so far. With all of the dawn drops gathered, we return to the Walk of Echoes with Lilizette. Arriving, we confront Lilith and we defeat her. As Lilizette approaches, however, Lilith springs back to life and shoves her hand straight through Lilizette's chest, pulling out some kind of essence which she absorbs before wrapping herself and Lilizette in her wings, merging them together and becoming something new, Lilith Ascendant, a merging of these dark and light energies and her two alternate personalities. We triumph once again over this new form, and Lilizette eventually calls out from within the fused body, causing it to split. With both halves, Lilizette and Lilith, being consumed by Atomos. With both incarnations of Lilizette being consumed, Atomos now sees that both futures, dark and light, are equally likely and unlikely, and just decides to absorb everything, deeming that no future will come to pass now. However, it quickly becomes overwhelmed by the power and regurgitates all the memories it had consumed back into the respective peoples and worlds. We see Mayakov being approached by who we can only assume are Portia and Radulis before we cut back to Lilith and Lilizette. Here, Lilith tells Lilizette that their only hope is for Lilizette to carry over to the dark future, seal off Atomos from that timeline, and take up her mantle as Lady Lilith, leading her people to a bright future. We watch as the player and Lilizette share a touching moment before she dives through the mall of Atomos to seek off the dark future. 
leaving us to seal Atomos here in our time to ensure that this collision of timelines does not come to pass again. Kate Sith tells us that with their mission complete, they choose to leave us as the guardian of the future and depart. In the aftermath, we meet up with Mayakov, who tells us that he does not remember Lilizet at all, her choice to traverse to the darkened timeline seemingly removing her memory from everyone. But he informs us that Rajalis has been reinstated as a knight, and that the wedding date for him and Portia has been set. It, it's like right now, actually. So we rush to Juno to see the ceremony. At the party, we learn that Rajalis and Portia awoke in Sandoria with no memory of anything that had happened, with a note telling them to thank both us and Lilazet. They discuss the name Lilazet, saying that it would make a great name for a child. And that wraps up the main storyline of Wings of the Goddess. I know it's really confusing in some spots, but I think the story is alright, if not a little bit confusing. However, I did want to take some time to talk about how this expansion was received at the time of its release. When Wings of the Goddess came out, it was not popular. People really liked Scholar and Dancer, the jobs added in the expansion, and Dancer even ended up becoming a sort of a meta shakeup thing that completely changed the way that people played the game in some instances. However, Square Enix made an interesting choice with this expansion, where they delayed the delivery of the majority of its content, and instead delivered only a small amount of content with the actual expansion release. The rest of it would come with six total add-on scenarios that were released over the course of the expansion's life cycle. Each of these would bring small additions to the story and content. All in all, this meant that the Wings of the Goddess expansion, which released on November 22nd of 2007, was not complete story or feature-wise until December 7th, 2010. I'm not going to go super deep into the method behind how this fell apart in the video, but this series of events that unfolded in this three-year period is considered to be, by many at least, when Final Fantasy XI kind of lost its way, becoming a game that is not what the OG players wanted to continue on, and many quit during this time for various reasons. Okay, now I'm actually done. That was way too much. Uh, I appreciate anyone who made it through the whole thing, and I hope you feel like I've earned a subscription, a like, and a comment. Let me know what you'd like me to talk about next, and I'll catch you on the next one. Thanks.